So this uh, is the first lecture about machine learning for music information retriever. So we are already uh, to the fourth lecture. I'm going to divide today's lecture into three parts. The machine learning fundamentals and uh, <coughs> practical issues. These practical issues are most relevant in fact, for two group projects, one is about using sensors to generate music. The other one is about sound thing analysis. Okay. Finally, about these classification libraries, I would expect that uh, um, the GAs and uh, particularly Weiwei is going to discuss about the um, machine learning libraries in the tutorial as well, right? All right. <coughs> So, what is machine learning? Okay, so many of you already know this. Can anybody give a good summary? What is machine learning? Anybody wants to volunteer? Come. Uh, it's to what this machine learning does is that that is it has some kind of way of learning from data to be able to then often classify other similar types of data. So for example, if you have if you give a machine learning algorithm one thousand or hundred thousand pictures of the letter B, and then you give them one picture of the letter B and one of the letter A, it should perhaps be able to classify which one is what. And also you should give them data that is not the B as well. Alright. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, I think it's like a model, usually a mathematical model that can train the machine itself. It's similar to his definition. It's like inputs many data sets and train the machine to learn from the data sets and improve its accuracy. Okay, very nice. So, basically it's a computer program that learns to solve problems from data. Okay. Then, let's have a look of a few examples. <coughs> computer vision, many of you already kind of touched on this topic. Natural language processing. Has anybody worked on natural language processing? Raise your hand, please. Very nice. What did you do with uh, natural uh, language processing? I worked on multi-label intent classification and question answer. Question answer and, and multi-label? Intent classification. All right. And also information extraction. Okay, fantastic. And then music information retrieval, of course, that is something that we uh, care a lot about that. And then about the gesture recognition, dance movement recognition, that is actually related to one of the group projects that we are going to do. And hopefully by end of the semester we can use such kind of system for a class closing concert as well. So a toy application is about a fish sorting. In this kind of a situation, uh, assuming uh, you are from uh, Sweden, right? Yes. Not from Norway. In Norway, of course, this uh, salmon uh, sorting is an important business. So how do we do that? We use a video camera to take a picture of these uh, different fishes. And then we process this image and then try to classify the fishes to different kind of classes. And we are going to put the uh, salmon to one basket and then a uh, sea bass to another one. That is a very simple toy example of classification. And uh, to talk about the text categorization, we can, for example, classify your emails, whether it's a spam or not, and then Financial is the, the topic is finance related or sport related or something like this. Okay. Then about the music general classification. In fact, that is a group uh, project last year. We talked about the music general classification. What are we talking about? We have a lot of music albums here, so we try to classify them to, for example, pop, GS, classics, and so on. So applications of machine learning problems, there are a lot of different kinds of applications in real life, including all these group projects uh, in this class. 
In sense of machine learning problems, a pattern exists. For example, and the, when we learn the concept of trees, right, we will see a lot of trees in our life. And the next time when you see any of these uh, kind of uh, picture of, 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 of the trees that are similar to this one, you know that what is uh, the thing. But it's difficult to pin down formally or mathematically. How do you kind of uh, put it into a formula? And uh, we have data for it in our memory. So using this memory, basically a rule to do this kind of decision making. A machine learning framework, we have the experience learning from um, the past experience. And we learn this and memorize these rules. And then we apply for that. Similarly, we learn the knowledge from the lecture tutorials, and we will apply to solve the problems in the assignment and the group projects. Okay? Of course, only if you really learn the concept, you will be able to answer this question, because the examination even, or project, is not going to just apply the formulas that you learn from the class and then to solve the problem. It's not that straightforward. So the problem Formalism. We have a input data x. We have an output um, data y. In our case, the input could be music data, and then the output could be general labels. And in uh, movement detection, for example, we can also define the output as each of these dance moments. Then we have a target function to map this input to the y, and then the annotated training data set, we must have a pair of the input data together with this label. That is very important. And then with this kind of training data, we will be able to learn the function. Okay, x, y, and d are given. The target function f is unknown to be learned. And we learn this through training. We will learn the function f from the data d. Okay. Statistical modeling, we classify this thing into two general classes. One is curve fitting, regression, the other one is classification. For this semester, we are going to put more emphasis on the classification problem. So this is something that we try to categorize machine learning methods. First of all, if we have this annotated data set, these x, y pairs, then we call this as a supervised learning method, otherwise it's unsupervised. And then from this supervised learning method, of course, and the, uh, what I was talking about, we can divide this into um, classification and regression. So classification problem is that these labels could be a binary, just a two class classification. The output can only be 0 or 1. Multi-class could be anything uh, like a kind of integer number of classes. And uh, that is a <coughs> multi-class problem. Multi-class and multi-label problem, in particular uh, in, the, in the music general classification problem, for example, one particular piece could be both, for example, jazz and the pop music. Oh, is it possible? Or the idea is sick? Okay. Yeah, and then this is a multi-class and a multi-label problem. So one important distinction between classification and regression is that these classification outcomes must be integer. But the regression could be a real number. And if we can rank, for example, and uh, the, how should we say that? And then if we, each, each student in the class sing a song, we can rank the, the quality of the singing, and then we can map everybody's singing into a real number, okay? Something like this. Then the output could be a real number. It's not necessary to become an integer number. But if we don't have these uh, uh, labels for the input data, then generally we call it uh, unsupervised learning, 
and the general method include canyons, uh, hierarchical top-down and bottom-up approach. As I said, that we are going to put more emphasis on the, for this particular lecture on the classification problem because it's directly related to the group project and assignments. So, my question to you to wake you guys up is that what kind of task is activity recognition that is related to one of these group projects? What do you think? Yeah. So, what is the problem according to our category here? So, activity recognition. So, and the, for the first lecture, and the Mick gave a demonstration, and the, we try to detect the action, mapping the action to some. So, what is the problem? So, is it a classification problem, regression problem, is it a supervisor or unsupervised? Anybody wants to try that? Yes. Uh, should be as a multi class. Or multi class? Huh? Yeah, multi class classification. Classification. So, <laughs> this category. Yeah. so, we will be able to detect each action, unique action, and then map this unique action to some. Yeah. Okay. So, you could do it like multi class if you have your hand doing one thing and you have another thing. And that's I'm sorry? If you, have, if you have your arms doing one thing and you recognize arm movements and leg movements separately, it might be multi class. Aha! <coughs> okay. uh -huh. All right. What you want to do that thing. All right. So, Mick, what do you think? I think, um, yes, yes, what he just said was uh, correct. So, it could be a multi-class, also a multi-label problem, right? Yeah. All right. Okay. So, what do you think? Oh, I, I agree. Think. I think it's a multi-class, multi-label. All right. Okay. So, and then machine learning procedures for classification, we must have training data. And, as I said, the training data must include not only the raw data here, but also the labels here. That's the expensive part. And then, for the input data, <coughs> we need to do the feature extraction. And then, together with the label data, we are going to train this function f. Then, after this training is finished, we put the, the algorithm into test. We are going to use exactly the same feature extraction module here in this testing phase. We are going to exactly use the training function f here, but for this testing part, we only have the test data without the label. Our job is going to go through this entire procedure to predict the label. That's the idea here. Okay. Then understand the data set, of course, and then there are a lot of the data set available for the music information retrieval tasks. And now I have a question to you. Assuming that we do a music retrieval task search for a piece of music, right? Assuming that we have a two-dimensional feature. This is the, my feature space here. Here we have song A and a song B. That is my query. I want to ask you which one is closer to my query. Is it obvious or not? Zeros. B. B is closer to my query, correct? So remember, as I said, I project the song or any of these, like this uh, dance movement, the gesture, into the feature space. So we wanted to compute the distance measure between my query and the object itself. So in this case, the feature plays a very important role. And pay attention to this one. I actually generated this animation to show you the point here. When one feature and the other one, if they are not normalized, what is the consequence? 
I just do a very simple operation of this feature uh, x1. Okay. So what do we do? We divide x1 by 100. Did you see that? Yes. Before that, this is x1, x2. This is a two-dimensional feature space. But for some reason, if I forgot to normalize this feature one, and the normalization process is a simple division to by 100, what happens now? We do this for all the data points, but the impact of A is far more than any of these other points. And as a consequence, after this normalization, you can see which one is closer to, to my query. So that's the importance of data normalization. When you do the project or assignment, right? So you would forget this process. It could become problematic. So therefore, feature must be normalized first before you do the analysis. Uh, analysis. Now, <coughs> I have another, another example. So which song is closer to my query? Now, I project this song again, uh, these three data points, right? Still two-dimensional uh, feature space, x1 and x2. So which one is closer to my query? B, uh, Q here. So what do you think? Yes, B this time is closer, correct? So then it is correct in a sense because very much depends on what distance measure we are talking about. Okay? <clears throat> so let's see. If we are talking about the Euclidean distance, clearly your answer is correct because the distance between these two points definitely is shorter than the distance between Q and A. However, look very carefully. If we change the distance measure to a very common metric called a cosine distance. Cosine distance is defined by the angle between these two vectors, between these three vectors. In this particular case, you can see and the A and Q is much closer compared B and Q. You agree with that? So simply because of the different definition of the distance measure, we also determine which point is closer. So these are the two important messages I wanted to deliver with this animation. Is that clear or any questions? Because this is really important. Okay? Very nice. So you must know your distance measure. Of course, I just gave two concrete examples. One is Euclidean distance, very commonly used. One is cosine distance measure. But there are many other distance measures as well. Okay? But anytime if you use a different di distance measure, so then the distance are going to be different. Okay? Uh, this is the one interesting kind of example here. We are talking about a lyrics feature. We have students also work with the natural language processing, right? So we try to present uh, the, a large lyric data set uh, in our database using two features here. One is the number of words in my lyric. Two is this idea uh, the uh, feature commonly used in the uh, in the natural language processing. Can you remind me what does this uh, idea mean? Inverse document frequency. Inverse document uh, frequency, right? So correct. So then when we project this uh, our million song data set into this space, it looks like this. I was just curious, so what are the extremes for example there here this one is a a, a outlier and then here uh, two is very low in this idea of t and then pretty low in terms of the word per song and you can listen to this the first song is 
Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, North Yemen, Kuwait, and Bahrain. The Netherlands, Luxembourg, Belgium, and Portugal, France, England, Denmark, and Spain. Can you guys hear from the back? Correct, right. So then the second one is this one. So can you see, these are the actual lyrics, can you see what is the significant difference here, which actually separate them? We are talking about the features, right? So, Hui-Chan, can you tell from these lyrics, what is the significant difference between these two lyrics? These are actual lyrics in our data set. Um. Other than the word N um, in the first one, uh, the rest of the words are unique, which means they only appear once. Um, versus in the other one, they're kind of... Okay. Very correct. Has everybody clearly understood it? Because this song basically lists a lot of countries, right? All these words are basically unique. But here, these words are much more common, correct? So that's why this one single feature already can clearly distinguish these two classes. Feature selection are important. So we have to select the good features, which distinguish well between the journal and increase the accuracy of the algorithms. Features are classified to time domain features, like zero crossing rate that we discussed in the first class, and then frequency domain features, like a spectrum flux, and in the second lecture, and then perceptual domain features, like this MFCC we have discussed today. And supervised learning. These are the definitions about supervised learning, and uh, in this case, and we have a song, we have a class label, for example, about the general classification. No, potential models of things uh, in the beginning, a few years ago, not so many students have taken machine learning classes, but now, since machine learning is so popular, many, many students are going to take it. So then, and we can go through this quite quickly, okay? I'm going to just quickly discuss about this uh, 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 nearest neighbors uh, method, k-nearest neighbors, software vector machine, and artificial neural networks. About this, uh, one year's neighbor. So, can anybody tell me how does this one year's neighbor work? Okay, Carl? You, you look at the, your data sets or the data you have, uh, and you have plotted them, like, or you can say plot, you have them mm -hmm. all distributed, and then when you get a new point, like your new song that you're trying to classify, you look at, okay, which is the closest point to this, and then you classify it as the same as that one. So, has everybody understood what Carl tries to, to, to say? I probably could easily kind of draw this line here. So, assuming that this is the one class, this is another class. Okay. Now, I have just a test sample in, let's say, this sample is somewhere here. So how do we do this? You need to understand the ideas behind it. So how do you do this one nearest neighbor uh, method to determine which class this guy belongs to? We actually explained this procedure already before. You should understand that. First of all, we need to present all this data in the same feature space. And here, in this particular case, we assume that we have a sim simple kind of two-dimensional uh, feature space here, right? So in this case, for this guy to find the nearest neighbor, what do we need to do? We need to compute 
the distance between this guy to all these other data points. Correct? Then they determine to determine so which one, just one label, which is closest to this one. Okay, then in this case, this distance is the shortest. So therefore, we will classify this guy to this black label. Okay, like label one. And then this label two. Okay. So this should be very easy and, uh, and clear. Then talking about the uh, hey, nearest neighbor classifier. So what are we going to do? Assuming this is the, the same case, if we are talking about uh, three nearest neighbor ideas. So can anybody kind of tell me how to do it? To do, we just illustrated this from the one nearest neighbor, right? So let's say now we have three nearest neighbor. How do we do that? Anybody wants to try that? Malaysia, come here and then you just kind of show me how to do it. Okay, go ahead. Don't worry. Um, it's kind of the same as like the first one. Yeah. Where, but the first one is just like one nearest neighbor, so you choose the close, like the single closest point that's close to this. Yes. Like this point. This is the one that we added. Yeah. So if it's like three nearest neighbors, three. then we choose like the three closest points to uh -huh. this one point. So it would be this one. Yeah, these sure. are. Yes. Um, and these two are like the closest one, and then out of these three points, choose the um, dominant class. Yeah. So, so like it would be this would be classified as this black cluster because yeah. there are two of those and one of them. Very nice. So you are clear to everybody. So this idea is extremely simple, but thank you. Yes. So now I have a following up question. So. Do you see any problems with this particular approach? I give you a skin. In this case, assuming that you guys choose to do a mixed project. So we have to do this computation with a smartwatch or smart sensor. Do you think that this K nearest neighbor is a great idea to use in this kind of environment? Yes or no? So, you forgot to put your name up. <coughs> MJ. Do you see any problem if you use this nearest neighbor, if you choose the uh, mixed project to detect the action using a smartwatch? If it is a good idea or bad idea, and why? That is a little bit ambiguous. Has anybody a kind of different answer? So Jonathan, what do you think? Did, did you understand my question? So I say, well, this is um, K nearest neighbor idea. And uh, Melissa nicely illustrated how to do this classification here. So my question now is that, do you think that is a good algorithm if you choose to detect the gesture from the smartwatch? The gestures that we define might be, uh, might, might be more limited than what our body can achieve. So if we define three actions mm -hmm. within this space, mm -hmm. but we do a fourth action that is completely different, it might be interpreted as closest to one, but actually it's very far from all three anyway. And it will still be accepted into one of the three groups because the distance, there's no limit to how far the distance can be, it's just minimum. Mm -hmm. But actually, what I'm trying to ask is a fundamental limitation that could become problematic, yes. Um, because you have to store every single point 
um, that you have in your training data, uh, you take up a lot of storage, especially if your data is very big. And also, um, it's, it's expensive to compute each time the bigger your data set is because you need Euclidean your distance for every single, like against every single point, each time you get one new test data. Question. If this is the examination situation, you get a full mark. These are the two fundamental issues we are talking about. Absolutely clear. <coughs> okay. So is that clear, right? So then when you guys answer the questions, please below, so that at every breaking, un, uh, listen and hear your answer. So is that clear? Huh? Yeah, because the problem is, if there are a lot of data, you have to store all this data there. Number two, you, you have to compute the distance measure with every individual data points in the data set. That is very expensive. So for an embedded system, and the memory is limited, the computational power is limited. So if you choose this kind of method for an embedded system, then you have to be extremely careful. So Nick, do you agree with me? Yeah. OK, very nice. <coughs> So this does not discourage you guys to take that project. Only you have to select the right machine learning methods for each of this project. Okay? So K nearest neighbor is very clear and uh, this is uh, just a summary of the K nearest neighbor method. Advantage is very easy to implement. And the disadvantage is large storage requirement, computational very intensive to recall. That is exactly what and um, uh, P Xuan, right? Excellent. How do we pick K is also quite tricky. Okay. The in short is a data dependent method, which is particularly challenging for embedded system. In fact, if you read my lecture notes, you already know the answer. So the question now. Given this weakness or short, um, kind of shortcomings of this uh, k nearest neighbor, do you know any better method which is probably even much better fit to the embedded systems application? Maybe like a support vector machine or something? Great, that is. I was suggesting that we are moving on to the. Um, yeah, yes. Linear classifiers, and uh, we actually have the data points here, like, sorry, like here we have the annotated data set of the black points and then the white points. So how would you classify this data? A very simple method would be to draw a linear lines here to separate these two classes, right? And then, well, based on this simple line, you can make a decision which class this belongs to. But the problem is that we can draw a lot of lines here which can satisfy this condition, right? Now, which one is the best? Any suggestion? We could draw millions of lines here, all the lines will be okay to do the job, but which line is the best and why? Geralt, any good suggestion? I'm sorry? All right, so and we try to define the concept of margins and try to maximize the margin here. The question now, okay, and then if we manage to find the maximum margin, uh, uh, margin, the three points there actually define the binary is called a support vectors. The question now is why it is a good idea to maximize the margin? I have a lot of questions so that actually you can really understand the ideas behind it. So why it is a good idea 
to maximize the margins to run. So in other words, what's wrong if I choose a different line? Because I have infinite amount of lines here to get the job done. So why this one we manage to maximize the margin is the best option. So because we are not going to derive the mathematics here, we wanted to understand the intuition here. Okay, Christian. Um, it's more robust, especially to data points that are slightly further away from um, like their own label. Uh, so that that's why you want to maximize to the margin so that they can fall into the margin and still be in the right classification. Very correct. So it seems to be, Christian, you have already taken machine learning class yeah. before. Okay, great. So then this is just to refresh your mind. The point here, if we draw the lines like before, and if you draw a line arbitrarily like this, right? So any noise to lead with data points somehow can cross this line, and then you will have a misclassification. But by maximizing this margin, you will minimize the possibility of that kind of misclassification. Okay? So that's the idea here. All right. SVM. Let's continue to discuss SVM about the so-called kernel SVM. Previously, we have a nice two-dimensional feature space so that we can draw a simple line to separate two classes. But now, we have a situation like this. We have a one-dimensional feature here. So the red dots belong to one class. The blue dots belong, belong to the second class. Can we draw a line to separate them? No. So do you have any idea how we can actually separate this then? with a simple method. Then so. Yes. The left. So, so. And the right. <coughs> I'm sorry? The left on less than zero is one. Can you repeat, I'm sorry? And in that, um, make, make two classification, classify. <coughs> the left is one and the right is one. You mean here? Yeah. Uh, regardless of where you set a threshold here, if you set here, and or set here, or anywhere here, you cannot simply classify into cl two classes, right? So, of course, you can draw a circle or something like that to do a classification, that's fine. But that is not the simplest way to do, or is not about a linear classification. So we still want this simplicity to have a simple line or simple um, surface or plan to be able to separate these two things. So the idea here is to how about the mapping this data to a higher dimension. In this particular case, if we actually map this one dimensional feature x to two dimensions, the, the second dimension is x squared. What are we going to have? You can see after this simple computation, we are going to project this data like this. And uh, in this case, these uh, red colored dots are going to be on this upper side, and then these blue dots is the, on the lower side. In this case, we can easily draw a line to separate these two classes. Is that clear? Very nice. 
So now we have a three dimensional kind of situation. I need to try to show you this example here. We have also kind of uh, a situation like this. The red circles here uh, belong to one class. The blue cross belong to another. In this situation, it will be very difficult for me to draw any line to classify these two classes. How can we do the separation still using a linear method? Give me an idea, by the way, and uh, this kernel method is a very fancy term in machine learning. So again, we are talking about a kernel here. Can anybody give me an example? The idea is still very similar to the previous uh, case that we managed to kind of project this one dimensional data to two dimensional space. So we can easily separate the same by one single line. Now we have a two dimensional feature space. How are we going to do that? Any suggestions? Yes, any suggestions? Um, Okay, what is the kernel function? Can you suggest a kernel function here? The previous kernel function is uh, actually uh, x squared, right? So, can you suggest a kernel function here so that you can easily kind of separate these two classes like this? Uh, z equals? Okay, so that is actually my uh, kernel function here. What does it mean is that you can see because in this particular case, these red dots are all actually close to zero. If we do this function, basically you map this two-dimensional representation to a three-dimensional representation, almost like you are right form, right? In this case, all these data points here are lifted to a higher point, and in this case, then we could easily draw a line here to separate them. Is that clear? Uh, surface, yes. So is that clear? Okay, very nice. So that's actually the, the two-dimensional uh, mapping method, and, the, and we are talking about it. In fact, this is not a very nice visualization because this kernel function like this, it should project like a rice ball, not uh, actually like this. Okay, so that's why uh, the, I prefer to draw a a figure on the white ball. Okay, what are the advantages and the disadvantages here? The advantage is very quickly evaluated and very accurate and powerful nonlinear kernels, for example. And the uh, disadvantage is uh, uh, that is a very natural kind of binary classification. Uh, can be heuristically used for multi-class, but is a little tricky to use. Non-trivial to pick parameters and a kernel function. And I just give some very toy kind of situation that you can easily see how you can design these kernel function, but in reality, designing this kernel function is not trivial at all. So this can be a problem for your project. Now, let's move on to a new topic that is a very hot topic nowadays, given the deep learning kind of uh, scenario here. The neural network is a multi-layered structure with the first layer as the input and the last layer as output. This is also kind of mimicking human brains processing. Right? Can you kind of do a analogy like just compare to human being? So for this kind of neural network, 
So how does it look like? Tries to mimic a human neural network in the brain. This is a general kind of uh, artificial neural net network structure. So this is our multiple input. This is the output layer. Can anybody give me an example? So in terms of the brain processing, what are the input data? Yeah. So I'm just using this as an example to mimic the human brain. Okay? Of course, for all this kind of computation, we must have input and output. So can anybody give an example? For our human brain, what are the input for our brain to process? For example, if you see anything, that would be the things that you see through your eyes. Okay, see from the eyes. And also can be like the music and the sound from the ear. Great. So all these sense, the vision, the auditory, the touch, smell, everything, these are the input signals to our brain. The output uh, to classification division, for example, and I can give a fight or flight division making, right? So given all this input you receive, you must make a division. So these are the neural network in your brain. But how do we try to mimic this uh, capability with a mathematic model? That is the neural network above. And uh, by the way, and, uh, given the popularity and the usefulness of this artificial neural network, we are going to also uh, introduce the deep neural network for the very first time. So Sai is going to present this concept there. So for this ARN, a fully connected ARN, each neuron is uh, in one layer, is connected with each neuron in the next layer. And then also this each connection between neurons has a weight, a parameter that needs to be trained. Okay. So the knowledge of this model is encoded to the weights of the neurons. And all these kind of explanation is just kind of you see different kind of network architectures. About the advantage and the disadvantage. So advantage is a very powerful neural, deep neural network represented as the state of the art. Disadvantage is that a lot of parameters, <coughs> the weights between the neurons, needs to be tuned and require a lot of data depending on the ANN architecture. So the question now, for your project, where you use deep neural network why or why not? We have already seen these three different projects, right? About pitch detection, reliable pitch detection. Two, about the gesture recognition. Three, is about the auditory scene classification. Do you think that you will use the deep neural network? What do you think? Jeroz, shake your head, meaning that you don't want to use the deep learning. Why not? Okay, he believes that we don't have enough annotated data. So, Yixing. So, for your project, do you think that you will use the deep neural network or not? You know, for this kind of applications, deep neural network, there are a lot of libraries that you can use nowadays. But you have to really make an important decision whether this is a good idea to use. In what kind of context you can use it effectively. Okay? Not necessarily is a good idea to always rely on deep neural network. As I said, handcrafted features are sometimes very useful. I like that because it is so simple. You don't need to rely on any training there. You can directly compute 
these features using a simple equation, as simple as that, right? So I don't think that even in today's world that every problem has to be solved by deep neural network. That's my message. So Sai, you agree with me? No. No? <laughs> OK. So <laughs> I mean, yeah. it is obviously possible to use that, but when you have a lot of data and when you need to train according to the data that you have, the deep neural network has to be used because not all the features, uh, the handcrafted features can convert all the information into the discriminant inf information for dividing into various classes and all. All right. Okay. okay. So, yeah, so what do you think about the possibility to perhaps uh, extract some features and put them along with other features into the neural network? That you would deep neural network. Yeah, exactly. So you, that might be an idea. If these are important, the network will give them high weight, basically, right? Mm -hmm. Is that like possibility? Yes. So, what do you think? I mean, uh, when you are using audio data, you normally extract uh, like spectrograms or some of some form of uh, features from the audio and pr apply that in the deep neural network so that you have a feature and you extract more complex features out of that in a deep neural network. That is normally the process that we can use. And there are also methods in which you can directly use a waveform into a deep neural network like 1D, con 1D convolution neural network or something like that. But it's more common to extract features. Yeah, the like the spectrograms or something. But then you would extract pretty many features, right? Pardon? How many features uh, do you usually extract then? How many features do I what? Yeah, do you usually extract? Like, do you like it depends. Actually, it depends on the, uh, uh, like, what do you want to solve? It depends on the problem. So, for example, if you have a scene classification task, you normally extract the spectrograms because it carries more information than, like, MFCCs or something like that. And it actually depends on the problem that you're solving, totally that, totally like that. Okay. But anyway, that is an important kind of a topic to discuss later on, yeah. in particular, before you choose your own projects. So the point is that, uh, sorry, my point is that I don't think that every problem on the planet can be solved or should be solved using deep neural network. Uh, I give you one example about this reliable pitch detection of one of these uh, group projects. Do you think that we need deep learning no. network to solve the problem? Nothing. Yeah. So we can use a simple equation to extract the pitch, right? Okay. So why do we need the machine learning to solve this problem? True. Correct? So that's the point here. Anyway, and I very much like this kind of active discussion and inaction. Now, we discussed a few different kind of methods and uh, machine learning methods and uh, models. How do we assess the performance of this particular model? Okay. So say we have two classifiers, like a K nearest neighbor or SVM. Or SVM and compared to kernel SVM. Or two different uh, artificial neural networks. So, which works better? So, in this case, we have a common approach to divide these into three different phases. The first one is called training, and as much training data as possible to be used for the training phase, and the validation used to set parameters, weights for uh, artificial in, uh, neural network and so on. Finally, test, test, a uh, test uh, that used to be used in the very last stage to describe <coughs> the performance. Typically, in your project, I would suggest that you use about eighty percent of the data for training to fit the model, about 10% data for the validation, and then finally use 10% of data for the assessment. Okay, does that make sense? Then, training validation and a test error. So I have put this error using this particular equation. Remember, and in this case, assume that this L 
is a loss function. So this uh, yi is the predicted label. And this y prime, for example, is the ground truth. You compute this two, the distance between two, the two. If your prediction and uh, completely kind of overlaps with the ground truth, then what is the kind of distance measure or the, uh, the loss between these two? Zero. It's zero. But in reality, it is impossible to always have this loss function of zero. So that's why and we compute these cumulative kind of errors there as the loss function. For training error, the average error of all the training data. And then validation is the error over the validation data set, this uh, remaining 10%, for example. The test error is the unseen data that you have never touched so far. So therefore, these uh, uh, three errors needs to be distinguished. And then for those of you who have already learned the machine learning, you probably know what is underfitting or overfitting. So for the training, of course, if you do a lot of training so that this curve perfectly fits to your training data, so is that a good idea? Why not? Because they're overfitting based on the test data. Yes, exactly. Then it too much kind of uh, the put all these kind of small details of the training data to the level that and that it will not generalize to anything that you have never seen. So therefore, you have to really find a trade-off between uh, the overfitting and the underfitting. Typically, you want to find the ideal phase here. For example, if this uh, training data set, so you do more training, then this training error is going to decrease uh, all the time. But uh, the, the, uh, the test error could increase. So you want to find the sweet point here that both this uh, training error and the test error are reasonable. Okay. Leave one out cross validation method. In this case, is that until you use actually everything but just one sample for the training and then and, uh, validate this particular one, you can compute these errors like this. This is one method if the data set is not terribly big. And the other one is so-called K-fold and the cross validation. Typically, is, uh, I, I do not know the style and you are probably the reading more machine learning papers. So is that a, a tenfold cross, cross, uh, cross validation is used more generally in the literature? Uh, yes. Or I, I'm not following actually. Yeah, no. For example, in this uh, uh, K for the cross validation, how uh, typically people choose the K? Uh, 10 for 5 for depends on how you vary your. Because is, it is usually used to avoid the uh, overfitting. Mm -hmm. And yeah, K, usually people use 10. 10 for. Usually it's 10. Okay. Like, uh, I use one for testing, for evaluation, and use uh, the rest of them used to for training or tune your development parameters. Ah, that, that is uh, actually, uh, is that a, a new one out across the validation? Uh, so this, uh, let's say, term for the cross uh, uh, validation, the idea is that you will divide your entire data set into uh, 10 chunks, right? Yeah. So then you will actually use 
nine chunks for the training, and I use uh, one for validation. Yeah. And then you will actually do this for every chunk of them, and then compute the average, yeah. right? Yeah. So use this kind of method for the k for cross validation. <coughs> it's actually a very standard method in the validation. And that is a summary of what is the tempered cross validation and it, and also the comparison to leave one out cross validation method. Evaluation, evaluation matrix, that is also something that is very common in uh, scientific publications there. And, uh, well, and the prediction, predictor labels, and uh, you have the true positive, true negative. If something is uh, is wrong, and then you predict it is wrong, and uh, if something is uh, is correct, you predict that's correct, and then this false negative uh, means the actual label is positive, but you predict as a negative, then that is a false negative. The other arrow could be the false positive, which is the actual label is negative, and uh, but the predicted label is positive. And then you can compute this accuracy, precisions, sensitivity, and the specificity here, according to these equations specified here. And the confusion matrix, and then in this case you will be able to see more details about what is wrong and what kind of error we are talking about. Okay, finally, and uh, I'm going to kind of move on to the part B about a few practical issues. This uh, is relevant to at least uh, two group projects. One is about the sensory that the uh, uh, some generation. The other one is uh, some thing uh, analysis. The uh, here the um, block diagram and is generated by me and is closely and related to the uh, action uh, activity detection. So we are talking about the sensor data input, but of course the sensor data could be microphone as well, right? So then we use uh, signal preprocessing, segmentation, feature extraction and then train the model and then test the model finally and then uh, do the classification using that particular model. <coughs> so the data set needs to be collected a data set for training and uh, I'm not sure and uh, Mick, in your case for the activity detection how much training data have you collected for your algorithms? Um. I now have like um, um, collect seven persons data. And seven persons data. Yeah. So how many actions uh, or classes are you uh, using? For each person, you have uh, fourteen gestures, and uh, for, for for each person, I collect fourteen gestures. Fourteen, 14 different gestures. Fourteen different types of gestures, uh -huh. and for each type of gesture I have 50 for each person that is uh, let me let me calculate 14 it. times 50 right 14 times 50 times 7 oh all right okay so as you can see this is actually quite a tedious uh, process and then you have to do the data collection and annotation to use this as your training data then when we do this test later on I wanted to say these algorithms should be robust enough if you develop this algorithm. I never used your system. If I use it, it should be as good as you uh, test by yourself. Okay? Something like this. And then you need many different kind of samples for each activity for generalization. So collect the data you said that for seven people, probably that is also not enough. What do you think? Yeah, yeah it's not enough. Yeah. Okay? As I said, Depends on your experience so far. If you do this project, you can choose to program on a smartphone or on a smartwatch. So, uh, as we discussed earlier, 
smartwatch is much more challenging in terms of development, right? Yeah. <coughs> sensor input. The sensor provides basically the raw data to the system. The sensors can be of different types, and we have accelerometers, gyrometers, and so on. And also each sensor may have more than one axis. Typically, we have three axes, X, Y, Z. And while multiple sensors can be used to capture an activity. So in this particular case, uh, I do not remember, and Nick, can you remind me for your project, and then how many devices uh, uh, can students use? You mean at the same time? Yes, at uh, the same time. We have tested six of them, but uh, it seems like you can do more, but I haven't tested. Uh, no, how many devices uh, the student is going to use? So just one smartwatch, yeah. just one smartphone, or we have multiple devices? Um, um, for the smartwatches, you can have two. Uh -huh. For the smartphone, you can have one. I think it's better for one person just use one smartphone to perform. All right, just to use one smartphone or two smartwatch, right? Yeah. All right, OK. But anyway, if we wanted to have something more demanding, that is fine with me. So for example, you can use four smartwatch or two phones. That's OK for me, I think. These are some real sensor data that uh, uh, Nick collected for the gesture of heat. And then this is uh, a sample uh, data set for the action of lift. So if you visualize this data, uh, heat and lift in this two-dimensional feature space, you have uh, this uh, orange one represents the heat, and then the lift one is the blue one, is to the corner. So if in the feature space you can kind of distinguish it as clearly as this one, the classification is not a problem. Uh, this is only about a uh, two-class classification, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, similarly, for this is the gyroscope. The first one is, the, I think, is the accelerator, right? Yeah. Very nice. Pre-processing. Pre-processing is can be important and uh, it can be applied to the raw data to smooth the signal and remove the noise. And uh, you can use, for example, low pass filter and high pass filter, stuff like this. Segmentation is a very important uh, step as well. Identify the start and end of the actual activity from the pre-processed signal. It is important to recognize the activity accurately. And a different segmentation approach can be used. So. Another technique is to identify when the movement starts and then can be marked by a sudden change in acceleration value and things like that. How do we do the segmentation practice? Assuming this xi is a feature extracted from the sensor, yi is the label. Okay? So we can do it like this. At the, uh, look very carefully, how do we do this uh, segmentation? This is the, our recorded raw data. Okay? The raw data, of course, and it's very difficult for you to, to judge and then when uh, certain action started. But we put in, we chunk this into a frame. Let's say um, xi. For this xi, we can predict this label uh, yi. Of course, after your model is trained, okay? Then, we can move on to the next frame, uh, xi plus one, and then we have uh, the label predicted, and so on, okay? So, based on this, we will be able to do a nice job into uh, classification, even segmentation, correct? Because maybe at the, from these four consecutive 
friends, everything predicted that is a hit. Or, and it predicts here is a hit, here is a lift. Then we can naturally detect these binaries. So is this approach a good approach compared to the second one? So we are processing exactly the same data, but with 50% overlap. In this case, okay, and this XI, when we have an uh, uh, output label computed, Second one is the label predict. Third one, and so on. So the first one is so-called no overlapping frames. Second one is overlapping frames. Which technique is better, and why? Because this is a very practical question, and uh, you have to apply into your project. Yes. Well, Cars. it looks like the overlapping even though it requires more calculation seems to be the better one because it kind of fits the the actual uh, if, if we see every like how do you say every cluster of uh, uh -huh. data as one perhaps uh, doing some kind of move or something mm -hmm. then the, with the overlapping you can over overlap like uh, one frame better on the actual movement mm -hmm. so in, for example if it would be like, uh, if, if it would take like a hand, someone lifting a hand, mm -hmm. and the detection would start in the middle of the lifting, mm -hmm. and then it would go down, like mm -hmm. it wouldn't really uh, match the actual one. So it seems like that one is better. Okay. So has everybody kind of heard what the car said? So any, anybody has anything to add? So the question here is, we could choose to have a non-overlapping approach or overlapping approach. Which one is better? Brian? Gerald? Okay, so then you need to kind of have a good understanding of why this overlapping method is better. So, Sai, do you want to say something? So overlapping method would be better because, uh, as he said, actually, he completely explained what uh, is the problem. If we are and if we are trying to recognize a gesture when we are already moving our, our hand, it will be really hard to uh, understand like what was the gesture. And it might actually, uh, there's another problem with the overlapping gesture is uh, if you move your hand and it might recognize it twice, that is another problem that might be uh, possible. Mm -hmm. So, depends actually. Overlapping is way better because it has lower time latency and... That is a very important property. Because in this particular case, look, for this case, right? So, we are going to have output. Assuming this uh, one frame is one second, right? We will actually get the output only after one second. Or if the the window is two seconds, and then you have to wait every two seconds to get the, the output. With 50% uh, overlap, so basically the time resolution is uh, is improved. So, Han Guang, do you have anything to add here? Uh, if you need to solve the latency problem, how about uh, to use some lower resolution, uh, higher resolution, you extracted the feature. Sorry, you need to be loud. I cannot hear you. Uh, so this is a kind of interval feature, right? Sorry? Interval feature, I mean, yeah. each so feature has a uh, time unit. Yeah, so here is the classification problem. So we have the sensor data recorded here. Yeah. So we have to actually process this frame-wise. We choose a frame length. Either we can choose the no overlapping like this. For every frame, we are going to have one output label. So this is the time point that we can get an output label, and, and so on. So the second approach is that we have overlap, overlapping window. So then, so this output is uh, going to be twice as much. 
Yeah. But how, I have a question. Uh, how do you then detect? Because I'm guessing different gestures will take different amount of time. So, and if, for example, the the window is based on a time interval, mm -hmm. then how do you uh, notice uh, movements that are more than more complex movements that might be more than one window? Uh, That's a window. very good point. Because those are actions, right? And the duration could be different. So how do we address this problem? And uh, is a long window a good approach or short window is a good approach? Well, it feels like if you have a long window, then it will be difficult to notice short movements because then you might be able to do multiple short movements in one long window. Uh, so it depends on the situation, but is there no way to be able to detect both uh, smaller and longer? That is actually one of the very interesting points to raise here. So did you guys understand? In real life situation, the actions, some of them could be long, some of them could be very short. So in this case, to process this thing simply, we typically choose a fixed window lens and process that. And then uh, Carl's point is that if this uh, action is for many uh, frame lengths, and it will be hard for this one sing single frame to guess, right? Which label is that? Or if you choose this window lens quite long, actually in the middle of my uh, window, the gesture change, right? From, from one to another. So then within this one frame, it's going to be very difficult for this uh, algorithm to guess which one is that. So do you understand? One frame. I have two actions within this one frame. This becomes problematic. Very good things. So that's why these kind of issues I wanted to raise so that you can, you can understand and then also you can find a solution for your project. All these are very valid problems to consider. So, Marisha, did you understand this problem? So it's very tricky to find the window lens that is correct for everything because all these actions the duration could be different. Some actions is long. We want to have a longer window. Some is short. And uh, you know, this long window, or the one window is not going to fit with every problem. So come, how can we address this problem? How can we solve this problem? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. So usually you have to, so if you can use some current neural networks, you may capture the dependencies over time. Sure. And so what you are saying, this problem is kind of discretization problem. Uh -huh. uh, which it's means quite if your time units, I mean each frame is small enough, then it can solve a problem, but it also add another problem, that is the latency of computation. Uh -huh. That you will, it's really, it's not uh, computation efficient uh -huh. if you set your small units uh, as small as. Uh, so, what what is your proposal? <coughs> Should this window length long or short? Uh, if this is short, you can it can solve your problem, but the computation efficiency it cannot uh, you cannot ensure the computation efficiency of your. All right. So you are proposing to use a short window. Yeah, you can use it, but. Yeah. But a computation is not very efficient. Yeah. Ah, that's your point, right? So why don't we, so for every time frame, every time frame, for example, at nth second, we consider previous frames and different previous frames, different uh, sizes of uh, previous frames for like last five samples or last 10 samples simultaneously. Uh -huh. And we like recognize what was the gesture in that specific time frame. And which was the most active one, according to the, if we create a model which is very compact so that it is not that uh, slow. Mm -hmm. And we just, we recognize all those specific uh, gestures. Mm -hmm. There's actually a time latency in that also because gesture recognition would be after you complete the gesture. Yeah. That is another, that's okay. like very. <laughs> How about, uh, yes. well, if we have more complex gesture, then maybe they, they whatever machine learning algorithm is supposed to break them down into smaller gestures and what that would be. Yeah in some way can make them stack up so that will be similar to what you said, right? So yeah. that it, uh, perhaps then if we get like a, so we'll get continuously respond with the gesture classification 
And then we have some way of knowing that if we have these five classifications <coughs> in a row, then it's a way for something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that the way? So all this, uh, actually, I did not even expect uh, and, uh, to have this kind of uh, kind of hot discussions about this. They are all very interesting problems. And uh, Mick, for your uh, tutorial material about this, all these kind of issues could be discussed there as well. Okay. Yes. And uh, it's very interesting, by the way. That is uh, pretty tricky to decide how do you do this segmentation whether you are going to use overlapping and things like that. And then, finally, you have to implement this on the small devices like that. Okay? And then we will also judge how accurate your algorithm is going to work, how responsive, meaning and how much delay, is it? All these kind of things will be put into test. I think that's a very interesting problem, right? Exciting, but a challenge. Okay. Yes. Awesome. For like second, for this problem, why don't you just define like a threshold value where like, the signal is larger than that value and we'll start like creating a new window and if it finds a plausible level, just like it's not uh, sorry, can you speak louder? So like <coughs> why don't you define like a threshold value where if the signal is greater than that value then like start like creating a window, uh -huh. um, and then when it falls below that value, then that's like the end of your window. So, so you are saying that I'm not going to use a fixed window. Yeah. The window length will change. Yeah. Oh, wow. What do you guys think? Uh, the, uh, uh, manager has a completely different kind of proposal. Instead of a fixed window, that is the simplest thing that we can do, right? But now you are saying that we have to adapt the window length in real time. Correct? But then, how do you decide the window length in real time? Actually. Correct? And uh, uh, Carl, you ha have some comments? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. It's a very smart idea. And also, but the problem will also be like if there are continuous movements mm -hmm. that are supposed to be classified in different ways. For example, if you wave and then do something like wave with that one arm and then wave with the other one directly after, then I, I think it would be difficult as well to. We have to have some good way of dividing the window then, like to know when to stop. Yes. Unfortunately, today we don't have enough time to discuss about this. That's why I will refer this to mix and the, you, when you prepare this material. This kind of thing needs to be addressed. How do you select the window lens? How do you do the segmentation? And then how do you find the balance of achieving good performance, detecting performance, while also kind of responsive, okay? And then uh, it is an interesting idea to have adaptive window lens. But the tricky problem is that you have to decide this window lens in real time. How do you do that? So in any given point, and because if I have a fixed window lens, I don't need to think, right? Every one second, I will go jump to another. But if I have every step, I have to decide, okay, what is the window lens? Based on what I can decide at this? Onsets. I'm sorry? Onsets. Like Onsets. Whenever you're starting to make a gesture, the acceleration of <coughs> the Oh, you mean in this case, here is my onset, right? Yeah. So then, from here, how do I know what is the window lens I should do? use? Actually, uh, so I was propos proposing the idea of using variable window lens, like recognizing variable window lens size, sizes together and seeing which one is the most active recognition. It's not like... Oh, so then family. you are saying that I will process the same data set with different kind of window lens. Yeah, previous uh, data. Like at every time point, you check previous data. All right. And various window lens. Okay. And recognize the most active one. Have you guys understood the size idea? And uh, I have to process these uh, same data, use different kind of window lens. Simultaneously. Simultaneously, yeah. okay. And uh, remember, on the smartphone and on the smartwatch. Yeah, that's very okay. Ah, okay. So think about that. All these are interesting questions. I very much like these questions. And uh, what do you propose? Actually, you have to consider, uh, do you understand the size suggestion? Uh, so just... so, uh, he is suggesting that, okay, I will use, for example, 10 different window sizes. 
and uh, process this simultaneously and uh, see which one performs better, right? Yeah, which one is the most active one? Wow. Okay. But then in your case, if I, I just use one window, then every time instance I need to make a decision what is the window I should use. You have to predict the future. That's the problem. That's very difficult, actually. Right? So, of course, ideally, I will know, oh, here is the next uh, uh, kind of onset, and then I use this as a window, right? Then you have to kind of check the data ahead of the time. Yes. But that's kind of, so this solution has already been proposed. It's like multi-convolution or transformer convolution or something. So, so you, you have, you have, if you have a filters, have more, uh, multiple filters, okay. the size will be uh, determined dynamically based on what you have observed, like the observations. In the past? Yeah. So you use the past experience to predict the future. Yeah, predict the, yeah, predict the feature, predict the uh, your model. The model. Primary three model, like okay. the convolution of theories. Yes, uh, interesting. All these kind of things, now we just can talk and about that. But in reality, how are we going to implement that? And then is another issue. Okay, anyway, and then consider this, if you choose to work on the sensor project or this auditory scene recognition, right? That is going to be the same problem, right? No. I mean, if you're trying to do that in real time, that's, uh, and it's not uh, that hard because you just have to detect what is, what is the scene, current scene. It is not uh, this kind of... Okay, okay. So we are not, uh, we do not require real time performance, right? Yeah. Okay, okay. So then this is a different challenge. Okay. Anyway. So about a feature extraction, this is a summary of these uh, points here, and then we can extract and uh, we can use uh, handcraft features. We can also use machine learning to learn features, deep learning to learn features, as long as we have enough data. So Nick, do you think that for your project, that deep learning is the, is the choice to, to go? I can use deep, deep learning. <laughs> uh -huh. You use the handcraft features, right? Yeah. All right. So, but uh, do you encourage the students to try deep learning? Yes, of course. Trying is uh, always a good choice. Uh -huh. but, uh, All right. You, you have to choose if that's suitable for your project. All right. Okay. Anyway, and then you can start thinking about this amount of these three projects, which one you are going to choose. Okay. Uh, by the way, we roughly define, we have uh, 18 students in class. We prepare to uh, divide the class to six groups and the three students per group. So then you, uh, the, you are going to be randomly assigned to a group. Then three of you will make a decision together which project to pick. You have the, you have the freedom to choose any of these projects among of these three. Okay. So we can, uh, about the feature extraction, you can have uh, time domain features and the frequency domain features and so on. Time to learn features, uh, we can have means, variance, medians, and a zero crossing, and so on. Frequency domain features, you have spectral power, entropy, peak frequency, and the subband power, and so on. All right, finally, and the, we are gonna touch briefly about the classification libraries. There are many uh, libraries for machine learning nowadays to support many different types of models like uh, uh, scikit-learn in Python and uh, TensorFlow and uh, Keras and uh, Vega. Um, so Mick, for your project, <coughs> did you use any of these uh, libraries? No. You have just program by yourself? Um, no, I'm using a uh my application, but oh. um, um, I don't quite remember the name of it. All right. So for Sai and the what kind of library have you used so for your project? Currently, I'm using Keras and TensorFlow for the deep space baseline. Yeah. Which one? Keras. Uh, Keras. It's right. Deep learning library. Yes. All right. So then, uh, how about Hangua? Uh, usually use uh, it's quite old library like Sina, Sina, Sina and PyTorch. Ah, uh -huh. you have not used any of these here. Uh, 
I got some experience on TensorFlow, Keras. <coughs> yeah. Keras, eh? And the first one, I see. Uh, Psyche. Yeah, right? It's also an old library. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> anyway, so with Psyche Linux, and uh, I was expecting, and uh, we we to talk about these libraries and uh, before the project starts. So do you think that we have also a, a assignment on the on machine learning, right? Uh, we have assignment on using Wika for machine learning. Which one? Uh, Wika. Wika. Okay. Good. Anyway, and uh, this um, something that I'm not going to spend a lot of time to discuss here, and then you guys are encouraged to explore and then try that by yourself first. Okay. Typically, this uh, libraries can provide also quite a nice and a visualization uh, tools to see the results. Okay, very good. So, conclusion: we have three take-home message. Machine learning is useful for making predictions based on data, and the supervised learning predicts some sort of label based on data, and the evaluation. Uh, of the accuracy, prediction accuracy is important. So that's it for today. And uh, Nick? <coughs> Any questions?